The question is, um, how is it that only JavaScript does this and the other languages don't? And the answer is, it's by design. It's very easy to have and very consistent to have synchronous programs that run one after the other. Um, however, in every major language, there is already an asynchronous environment. So for PHP and for Python, although it's not built into the language, there are extensions that you can run on top that kind of gives you a similar programming experience. Not the same and not as straightforward as in JavaScript, but um, they, they also have to follow suit because um, otherwise it just doesn't make any sense in 2018 to have a completely synchronous programming language. Um, so I have my imagination as a computer agent, <laughs> but I'm trying to imagine it is reading the line, executing, uh, waiting and going to the next line, next line, next line, and then going back to the line that wasn't executed. Exactly, that's perfect. Okay. So let's do an example. Oh, yeah. Okay. So let's do an example. You don't have to type this. So this is the red sign with red background and blue letters, whatever. Don't type this. Just watch. Um, I commented out the, the rest of the file. In fact, let me delete it so that you're not confused. Um, I have four console logs. Okay. Um, I run this and Um, since you're not really writing, I can actually um, do more advanced tricks. Okay. Um, yeah. So now whenever I save this file, it's going to restart. Um, so I said I have four console logs, right? These are currently executing synchronously, one after the other. Okay. There is a special function in JavaScript called set timeout. What it does is, it receives a function that does something and executes it after a certain number of milliseconds. So let's build this. Let's run this. What you're going to see, if I increase this to like 10,000, okay, what you're going to see is 1, 3, 4 prints now and 2 just waits for 10 seconds. And then after 10 seconds, it prints two. Now, this is a very basic example of asynchrony in JavaScript. Um, basically, what happens is the runtime goes over it line by line. And let us show that again. What executes is the first line. It's synchronous. Then what executes is the second line. It's, oh, it's also synchronous at this point. But what actually executes in the second line is the call to set timeout, which is a special function again, that receives this piece of code, saves it in the background somewhere, and after 10 seconds, it brings that back up and then runs it. So what comes up, please? Yes. Yes. So right after this, again, this executed, line one executed, line three executed synchronously, and then line seven executed. Because that is the synchronous order of things. And then line eight, executes okay and now i run this and then um line two executes because it's already been 10 seconds right let's run this again so line three executes set timeout started obviously it's not here but the output is here. And then it goes back to line four and that executes, which prints two. So you can have console log five here. Okay. And console log six here. 
and let me make it a little bit harder for you. Set timeout. Console log um, zero. And one more. Um, seven. So please, somebody raise your hands and tell me the order of execution here. What executes first and what is the second number? I don't know the answer. I just randomly type these numbers. I'm going to explore it with you. So it's fine if you don't know it. Just please go ahead and um, tell me, please. Wait, um, people who raise their hands. Yes, please. One, three, four, six. And zero, seven, five, two, five. Yes. Um, hopefully that's the correct order. Does everybody agree? Yeah. Okay. Let's run it. One, three, four, six, zero, seven, two, five. Yes, that's correct. Um, so basically, this is how you do asynchronous programming. It's as simple as this. Um, and it's so weird that other languages just don't have a notion of doing this. You have to. Um, create special threads or fork <coughs> processes to be able to do this. There are very, very complex structures to achieve pretty much this simple thing. Um, this is why Node.js, when it came out in 2010, was a huge hit for backend programming. Because for the first time ever, um, you can run a single threaded application, is what it's called, the single thread of uh, execution of synchronous execution, we call the thread. You can have a single threaded application that can run uh, for millions of users and still do their database queries, right? So, yeah. Yes, this is this is actually very very common in JavaScript. Um, the most common bit is. Let me try to show it here. The most common bit is with user events. So, for example, you want to listen to a click on a web page, right? When you click on a web page, you can display an alert box or do whatever you want with it that says SDF, whatever. Um, but this is basically embedded with the, the execution and the whole purpose of JavaScript. I create an event handler, an event listener, if you will, and I listen to the click events. Okay? Mm -hmm. And I say, I don't mind whenever it's coming in. When somebody is clicking the, the web page, just show an alert pop up. And that's what it's doing. And you can, of course, obviously also do it multiple times. So you can click multiple times, and whenever you click, you'll see this alert. So this is um, a nice intro to event driven programming, which is, again, again um, the, the source of JavaScript, basically. Um, everything is based on events on the front end. And on the back end, we can create our own events. For example, by um, reading something from the database, right? A database is, yeah, now I can't get rid of this, of course. Whenever I click, it's going to show the alert. Uh, I can refresh it, and it's going to go away. Um, a database, hopefully, is something that lives on another computer. It's a piece of software that's living on another computer. So when you want to say something to a database, or when you want to load something from the database, um, you're just giving the instruction to that person, hey, like fetch me this. And then whenever the result is ready, they are actually firing an event 
to you and say, hey, like ringing the bell, hey, um, your package is here. What you asked for is here, take it. And um, therefore, this nature of events is, is built into our operation of everything and our communication with every other server and database. And this is directly built into um, JavaScript. Again, you can simulate this with other stuff, um, with other mechanisms in other languages, but um, it's more convoluted. It's a little bit um, harder to do. OK, any questions so far? No? Is everything fine? Yeah, Nodemon. Um, well, it's, it's a special Node.js application that runs um, whatever file you give to it multiple times when you uh, hit save. It stops the current one and runs it again so that you don't have to go always go to the terminal and type node index, node index, node index all the time. You install it by typing npm install minus g nodemon. And um, hmm? yeah, npm install minus g nodemon installs it globally so that you can use it everywhere. And then you do nodemon index.js and yeah, it's running. Okay. Obviously, this is also an asynchronous application, right? It's listening for your file save events. Because whenever you save a file in your computer, it's triggering actually multiple events um, in the operating system. And Nodemon is listening to those events. And when the file is changing, it's restarting itself. It's restarting the application <laughs> when the file has changed. When it receives that event, it restarts the application, right? Um, OK, well, I hope it's clear to you why we need asynchronous programming and how straightforward it is in JavaScript. The next thing to know is the name of this function. The function that we pass to set timeout is usually referred to as a callback function. OK? Callback. Have you ever heard of callback functions? Yeah? Um, it is basically an event handler function. Um, whenever there's an event, it calls you back, basically. For example, for the set timeout, we say, hey, um, just call me back after seven seconds. And we're giving it this callback function. And after second, uh, seven seconds, it's executing this callback function, right? Um, this is why it's called um, a callback, basically. And so the idea is everything is built with this callback functions. Um, every asynchronous operation is built with, with this callback functions. Can you identify the callback function here? Is there a callback function here in, in the line that I wrote? Yes, please. Yes. And inside we are just. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, which is the other one? Yes. So the callback is here. This thing. This is a function. Um, you can do anything with this. It doesn't have to be alert. You can also do console log hello world. And when you run it, whenever you click the page, you're going to see um, multiple hello worlds like 10 times. Um, so that is the callback function. And what we mean by writing this is, hey, whenever there's a click event, OK, just call me back. I'm listening to click events. Whenever there's a click event, call me back. This is why it's called a callback function. And it's actually doing what it's promising you to do. This is also another keyword, keyword that we're going to tackle um, today. Um, is the idea kind of clear what a callback function is? It's basically a function that's going to be executed, hopefully, in the future. Can we guarantee that it's going to be executed? No? Only if the event is triggered. How about in this case? 
Um, I have set timeouts. Can I guarantee that this um, these set timeouts will will trigger and will work? Like, can I guarantee that I'm gonna see two and five at all times? Okay. Let's try. Um, I'm running node index.js, which is running this file, and I see one, three, four, six, zero. What did I do? I stopped the program. Now will that thing execute? Will I see two and five? Yeah. Huh? Is that a live after that? No. <laughs> Ooh. I mean, I think in this context I could make it happen, but I don't want to promise. Um, <laughs> Sorry? But you want to put something that tells. Leave at least. Yeah, yeah, I could do that. Um, as long as you reach. Yes. The same, okay? well, as long as you. Perfect. Um, so, correct me if I'm wrong. I think um, you're not coming from a programming background, right? <laughs> but the questions that you asked so far, and including in the previous classes, but specifically in this class, in this lecture, are extremely spot on and always the right way to think about programming. Because if you remember the first lecture, in fact, programming is modeled after life. If you have thought about life at any given time, you're good to go as a programmer already. You just need to uh, discover that it's very similar. And what you refer to is actually a paradigm called graceful exit. So at any given time, I hit this control C and I stop the execution, right? What it does is it creates an event. It creates an exit event and tells the program to exit. Okay? And if, if any, at any given time I know that there is still work in the program, I can say, hey, wait, I'm not gonna exit. I'm gonna do a graceful exit. I'll first finish my job, finish my work, and then I'm gonna exit. Okay? Um, and this is actually the building block of building um, asynchronous programs that are resilient, that are robust. Because you cannot have this happening. If you have asynchronous programming, you cannot live with this. Somebody was promised to see 2 and 5, and they don't. This is not acceptable. If they are promised to see 2 and 5, they should see it. As a programmer, that's your job to make sure the program doesn't exit before printing this. Now the fix to this is a little bit more involved, so I'm not going to do that, but I'm going to show you um, how you catch those events. So there is a special variable called process, um, and you can listen to the exit event. I think. Let's try this. Oh, didn't work. Um, apparently, it's not process on exit. Uh, one of the TAs, if you can look for this exit event, then we can um, display it. And then, then, then we can talk about it. But the idea is um, basically, you listen to the exit event, and whenever there is a control C or something, uh, coming from the from the outside, you can um, handle that and then do whatever you want and then exit the the program. Um, is it sigint or something? All right, like this. Uh, yeah. Oh, no, it's not. Pro process that exit exits the process. Yeah, I tried it, but it didn't work for some for some reason. Um, I don't know. There's a, there's another signal. It's not exit. It's like sig up or something, something like this. I don't know. Anyway, um, the actual uh, syntax doesn't matter. But this is 
a way to build graceful um, exit applications. And yeah, again, if you are good at life, you're, you'll be very good at programming and you can advance very quickly. Please, a question. Why would I ever use this? Why and when? Um, and the answer is when I'm when I want to build robust applications, when I want to always fulfill what I promise people that I'm going to do. Like here, I want my program to promise me that whatever happens, I'm going to see zero. I'm going to see seven, which will happen in the future. So if somebody comes up and says, hey, stop this process immediately, I want to stop that. Because I promised that I will um, show these lines, okay? And before showing them, I don't want to close, I don't want to die. Yeah. For example, um, a very, very life, um, real life scenario is when you search for something on Google, right? You type something into the search box, it's going to Google servers, and Google is apparently, of course, very fast. Um, but what happens if Google is rolling out a new version of Google.com, okay? Rolling out a new version of a software means that killing, uh, means killing your previous servers. <coughs> so whatever servers was running the previous version of Google.com, they stop completely. And then um, the traffic is handed over to the new machines with the new versions of the software. Now, Google does this a couple of thousand times a day behind the scenes, and it's happening behind the scenes automatically. And it's happening because of this. They have a lot of mechanisms to make sure that nobody loses their searches, and even though they're replacing the actual software running behind, you always get the response. Um, nobody's ever saw Google down um, in the last 10 or 15 years, I guess. However, GitHub was down last Sunday, right? So that never happens with Google. It's because they are building really resilient systems. They make sure that when you want to access, access something, you do. And whenever there's a, uh, a problem in the system, there, there's a break, um, in the system that somebody, something broke, um, they have mechanisms in place to at least fulfill your request. And then maybe they won't be able to serve the next customer because something huge came up, but at least they're going to serve you because they promised you those results. Um, this is about quality of service, and um, obviously you don't have to do this. However, um, if you do it, it's best for your customers. Try what? Um, before exit, like this. No. Anyway, doesn't matter. Um, I'm going to find the actual syntax and I'm going to write it on, on Slack and you're going to be able to see it. It's something we, um, we do pretty much in every project that, that we're, we're building. Um, it's, it's a good way of production engineering. And the thing is, you do it only once, and then you forget how it's done. So with every new project, you look it up. By the way, 90% of modern programming is looking for stuff on Google. Nobody knows the answers to um, pretty much anything. We're all looking up stuff on Google and Stack Overflow. So it's perfectly fine to Google stuff. And um, that's how we remember the things. Because there are so many different things that you have to learn and keep in, in your mind. Of course, you're not going to memorize the individual syntax of process exit. Because again, you're just using it once per every project. You're typing it once per every project. And if you are sharing code between your projects, for some projects you're just copying and, and pasting all this boilerplate, you don't even type it anymore. Um, so I don't remember 
what the actual syntax is, and I don't mind, and it's perfectly fine. Um, like the array methods, how they work, obviously you know some of them, or you'll learn some of them, and they will stay in your mind because you're gonna use them every day. But some other stuff, no, you won't know. Like even when I was writing document.buddy.ed event listener, I was unsure of the syntax. And the reason is because I haven't written this for real for like, I don't know, five years or something. Uh, because you're using a lot of other libraries that already does this for you. You don't exactly remember the, the actual syntax. That's, that's okay, that's fine. Uh, and then you can just look it up. Um, I was lucky enough to remember this, but I was unlucky to remember this. Maybe they also changed with the Node version because these things are maybe prone to change with new versions of the Node coming up. But again, that's, um, that's not a problem. Mm. Don't worry. I was wondering, I had questions in the um, in the code. Code. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of <coughs> and also the answers is in the way. Are we going to cover them? Yes. Is this a passive aggressive statement to move on? <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, sorry. But yeah, um, we're going to talk about them right now. Um, if, yeah, I can get rid of this terminal. Cool. Now, hopefully, you all downloaded the examples because I'm not going to type these. I'm just going to show you the code and talk over them and run them with the debugger. Okay. In the folder week three dash one, you have um, an index.js again, which reads some files over and over again with um, different approaches and different versions. OK, and we're going to talk about this. Um, and then there's another folder called files, and there are three files in it, one, two, and three. OK, they're just dummy text files. Um, it just reads Erste, Zweite, and Dritte. Um, yeah, <laughs> that, this was my attempt to learn German. <laughs> in fact, um, the first open source library that I wrote in Germany um, two years ago is called Erste. Because German names are not common in the open source world, and all the other names are taken. So um, it's a safe bet. The second uh, library that I wrote is called Recht, um, I think it means law, um, because it deals with access management and stuff, like a judge. Um, so Das Recht is a nice name for a library, in fact. Um, but yeah, it really helps. This is my attempt to learn German, and I suck at it. OK, so now we're going to see examples of reading these files with different programming approaches. OK? Um, the first example is the synchronous example that we all had in our homeworks as well, right? We were making use of read file sync. Again, I don't expect you to write these. These are already in the folder. If you don't get these files, they're on GitHub. The link is in the Slack. So just go download them and, and then you can see them. Um, so just watch and um, and hopefully learn. So the first approach is the synchronous one, right? When I run this application, these lines will execute one after the other. And when I log it, I'm going to see Erste. I'm reading the second file. Read file sync is the method that everybody used right, um, in their homeworks. You see the second file, the first file, the, the third file, you see Plite, or however it's pronounced. Don't judge me based on my German pronunciation. Um, OK, so these are the three files that I'm reading. And these are all synchronous operations, right? Um, the question is, what happens if this, these files are large, like, I don't know, 3 gigabytes, 5 gigabytes? 
a lot of a lot of records in them. Not only one meetup or not only one text file that writes Arsta in it, but you know the whole database of Facebook. What would happen? Please. Yes. Exactly. Um, synchronous operation is blocking. We call it blocking because it's like it's like the most important thing in the world at that um, point in time. Like if I run this again for this program, line nine is the most important thing in the world, and everything stops. Everything blocks until it executes. It's like Trump going to his home in New York. All the streets are blocked and all the traffic is locked for like three hours or something until he is safe. Um, so when you have this, if the file is too large, what will happen is until we read it into memory, let's say it takes 10 minutes, we're not going to move forward to the next line for 10 minutes. And of course, the application can break, can die in between. And that unfortunately wouldn't work, right? Um, we wouldn't be able to read the file. So again, the center of the universe is now line 12, and now it's line, line 13. These are synchronous operations. And therefore, this is not a good approach. While I'm reading that file, I can do a lot more on the side, right? I don't have to wait for this thing. Um, think of these as a customer order coming to your backend application. Like they want to make a purchase, okay? And this is like um, send delivery to the customer. This will take days. In the meantime, you want to serve other customers. That's why, and you also should be suspicious of this name. This function is called read file sync. Um, because originally, normally, this operation is, of course, asynchronous by nature. Node.js is a non blocking asynchronous JavaScript runtime. Um, and the original name, of course, is read file. The only thing is read file. And then uh, there is this sync operation just for us to, you know, when, when, when you have small files, it's okay. You can, you can afford this. But when you have something big, you cannot use it. That's why the default is always asynchronous. And this is basically how you do it. This is the asynchronous version. This is the original version of um, of the read file operation. It's fs.read file. Okay. Now, what does it mean that it's asynchronous? It means that I have to pass in a callback function in order to receive the actual data, right? So let's do something. Let's put a breakpoint here. So it will execute these lines above, and then it's going to execute line 24, all right? And then let's put a breakpoint here, line 41. And let's run this. So line 9, that's good. I'm moving on. Let's see. I'm running the application. So line 24, this is the one that's going to be executed. And I'm going to end up, when I run a single line, I'm going to end up on line 41. I skipped all the lines in between because they are asynchronous. That's, they are going to happen in the future because there's a callback function here, right? This is a callback function. Oh, too much. Slow down. Yeah. <coughs> this gray thing here is a callback function. What I'm doing is I'm telling the program to, hey, um, read this file, the first file, one.txt. And whenever you're done, whenever in the future it is, just call me back. And after I run this, let's run this again. After I run for some time, maybe like 100 milliseconds or something, line 25 executes. And that, that is where I'm actually logging it onto the screen. Okay. The next thing that I'm do that, that I'm doing is I wanna try I, I want to read the second file. And then I call fs.read file, the second file. And I run it again. And then line 27 executes. This time it read the contents of the second file, it prints it to the screen. Right? 
So, bless you. Um, now on line 28, I'm going to tell it to read the third file. And then it's going to just, you know, in the background, read that file. Whenever it's done, it's going to call back this function here, this third function that has new contents in it. And then when you print it, you see um, the contents of the third file. So obviously, you can see some weird pattern here, right? It's going in like deeper and deeper and deeper, right? This is the problem with uh, the default mode of asynchronous programming. This is called callback based programming. Um, and what you're going to see is if you want to do things in order, you have to wait for that order first. Like here, I want to see the contents of the second file after I see the contents of the first file. Well, I have to wait. I have to wait until the first one is complete. After the first one, until the first one calls me back. And then I can read the second one. And then I have to wait until the second one calls me back. And then I can read the third one, right? Because I want to do these in order. Because I'm counting like first, second, third. I'm counting these things. So I have to wait. Um, that's fine. I can wait. But the programming actually looks bad. Um, like compare this to this version. This is a lot weirder. Um, please. So like from line 24 to 29, there are three callback functions? Yes. And three asynchronous operations. <coughs> yeah. Of course, if you don't want these to execute in order, you don't have to write this. If they can execute out of order, if you don't mind which one is written to the console first, um, you can take these out, right? You can put this here, and you can take this, and put this here. This one is going to work. However, you cannot guarantee the order. There is no, no promise from the operating system to give you the first file first. Now, when you execute this, since the files are very small, uh, let's comment out these so we, we only see uh, the output of those files. When you run this, you're almost always going to see that they execute in order. However, it's not guaranteed, especially if the files are differing in size. Oh, not this one. Read 3, 1. Yeah, it didn't work on my first run. Third, first, and second. When I run it again, second, first, and third. Even with these very small files, the order changes, right? If this is OK for you, then perfect, do this. If you have to wait for the previous, the result of the previous operation, though, you have to build this deeply nested callbacks, is what we call them. Or in other terms, what do we call it, Omar? Call the cow, yes. That's right. Yeah, that's a nice way of putting it. Usually people hate these things. That's why it's called callback hell. Because it becomes impossible to debug. Please. You cannot. You can't. Um, error is always the first parameter. Because in... Um, the question is like this. What happens if the second file is not there? What if it doesn't exist? How are you going to learn about this? There has to be a way of um, notifying you of the errors. The program has to, in, in some way, tell you about the errors. Now, in usual languages, um, there is the concept of try and catch blocks. So. If there's an exception like file not found, um, you write in a special block called try and catch. And there's an exception. It throws an exception, and you catch it. And that's how you learn about the, the errors. Here, you don't have such a concept because everything is happening asynchronously over time. So there is not some um, synchronous 
area that you can throw and catch around. I know you don't know about these things, or some of you don't, uh, but don't worry, it's, um, it's not related. Um, but the way for Node to let you know about the errors is by taking the first parameter of your callback. If you're writing in Node, and if you're doing callbacks, most of the time, the first parameter will be an error parameter. And if there is any error, like file not found, it will be passed um, along this uh, with this parameter. If there are no errors, then you'll, you're going to get the contents. Okay. In fact, we can maybe simulate such a scenario. So let's move the second file to. Let's rename the second file to something else, to new. So when you look at the files, we have one, two new, and three. So I don't know if this is going to throw an error, but let's try. Let's put a breakpoint here and run this. Debug console. Yeah. No, it already crashed. It didn't even um, give me that as an error. It was just a terminal exception, which terminated the program. Um, so we were unfortunate in this, but there might be other errors. The file couldn't be read or something um, that would be passed along with this error. Um, error parameter. Since for this example, I, I don't care about errors, I just omit the, the error parameter. Let's move it back. So that our example works. And it does. Okay. So this was the default way of doing asynchronous programming in JavaScript for a very long time, for like, I don't know, something like 20 years. And then people said, this is enough. We cannot take this anymore. Let's please find another way of doing asynchronous programming, because this is not helping. Many people died trying to read this piece of code and trying to debug it. I'm very, very serious. Like, the previous programmer working on the same project that you now have to work, and they left because they couldn't deal with this, wrote this, and this is very innocent. You have like five lines of code, three indentations, three levels deep, right? In production, this is like 20 levels deep, a thousand lines of code. It's impossible to know where uh, one variable is coming from. So people went crazy, and they invented a new way. And it's called promises. So if you notice my language, I used the word promises a few times um, up until this point, right? I said, I'm promising to give you this value. Like I'm promising to log this to the console in like five seconds, seven seconds, whatever, right? Um, I was actually hinting at this concept. Um, now, a promise is something, okay, I'm not gonna define what a promise is, but I will ask one of you to do it because everybody knows what a promise is in real life, right? Um, please raise your hands and tell me what a promise means for you in real life. I know it's a little bit hard, but you can do it. Yeah. Yes, it's a statement that I'm giving to a person to assure that I'm going to do something in the future and I'm going to let them know, you know somehow, or they're going to see the effect of it. Um, this is where the idea is coming from. And this is how you, this syntax of li on line 20, uh, 42 is how you create promises for the future in programming, um, and especially in, in JavaScript. You're like, hey, uh, I'm defining a new function, read file, OK? That's going to read files from the um, from the file system and in fact I'm using the same mechanism that I used before like this fs read file right I'm using the same mechanism but I'm wrapping it in a promise to make it nicer for other other developers to use so that they don't have to write this thing what I'm saying is I'm creating a new function read file so from now on from this point onwards whenever you want to read a file use my own read file function 
and don't use uh, the version that's coming from the library fs file. right? I wrapped it for you in a promise. If you use me, I promise you, I'm gonna deliver you the results of this file. Okay, does it kind of make sense? Yeah, and the special syntax is, you create a new promise, it takes in, again, ironically, it takes in a callback function, okay? Um, that has two parameters inside, resolve and reject. Now I know you're, you're gonna be confused a little, but these two are functions themselves. Resolve and reject are two functions that are passed to me. And whenever I'm done doing what I promised to do, I call the resolve function. Whenever there's an error, I call the reject function. This is how I let the outer world know that I'm done or I couldn't do my job because of an error, right? Um, this is basically the, if you will, the events that are moving through the system. Like I'm tasked with doing something, I promise something by creating a new promise. And then while I'm executing, I'm reading a file. And if there's any error, I'm rejecting my promise and say, hey, I couldn't do what you asked me to do, so here's the error. And if it's successful, I'm calling the resolve function and say, hey, these are the contents, please pass it along. Whatever I give to the resolve function will end up in the user's hands. And this is basically how you update. This is how you use the, the promise. If you look at it a couple of seconds, you'll see that it looks a little bit nicer than the previous one, just because there are no um, deep level nesting, right? What we do is we say read file and pass in the file name, much like we do with the previous examples. And then there's a special function called then which allows me to chain operations because I want to execute them in order, right? I'm going to first read the first file, then print the uh, contents of that file, then read the second file, then print the contents of that file, then read the third file, and then print the contents of that file. Now, <clears throat> sorry, if this syntax is um, confusing, you can use this syntax as well. This is basically the same thing. Line 52 is the same as line 54. Um, you can say read file, file name, then give me the contents so that I can forward them to console log. Or the shorthand, then read the file and then directly pass whatever you get to console log. Basically, it's the same thing. If you have one parameter coming through, and with promises, you always have one parameter that's coming through, you can directly write these things. Um, so this is how you build asynchronous programs with promises, please. So that means in uh, promise, it's always an error function, or all that function is included. Yes. Always. Yes. But here, at least the pain is dealt with only once. So there's only one callback function. The, the first unfortunate person who had to write that has now left the company. They served their time and left the company. And now you're using it and the result is much nicer. So the first innocent person wrote this, had to write this. And as a user, you're very well on, like you don't have to deal with that callback hell anymore or that weird function inside function inside function. Once you write it, you can directly use promises. Now all the libraries, all the modern libraries that have come up or have been updated since 2015 are running with promises. So when we go on um, next week and the week after with databases, you're gonna see that all the database operations, operations are actually asynchronous and you can run them either with callbacks like this, which is really hard if you wanna read if you want to read multiple records, or like this, promises, which is really 
more straightforward way of putting things especially it's literally reading like do this then do this then do this then do this please yes then is a property of the returned promise because read file is returning a promise and it has a function called then and then itself is also returning a promise this is again where it's getting trickier so that you can chain it so every time you execute then a new promise is created with the contents that you pass to it um, and you get a, 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 another callback uh, another promise back so that you can execute then on it again and then on the result again and then on the result again question Yes, the best. So this is just an example. Um, the dear name is a special variable in JavaScript to point to the actual directory that this file is in. That's why I'm using it here, so that you can run this from anywhere in your terminal, from any other directory. If you run this, this is going to work. Um, but it's just an implementation detail, it's just an example. Yes, exactly. It's a dynamic way of finding wherever your folder is. Yes, double underscore, please. Uh, and uh, back to callback function. And that has callback function of always two parameter, or it can be both? Good question. Callbacks can have multiple uh, parameters or arguments, let's say. Um, the only rule is the first one is always the error. That's the convention. And if you're going to create your own callback functions, always treat the first one as the error parameter and pass on the error to that first one. Um, but yeah, the rest is you can have many, many more parameters um, if you're designing your own functions. Um, but with promises, you always have one. Like, you cannot resolve with multiple parameters here. This doesn't work. You can only resolve with one parameter, or you can also only reject with one parameter. OK? Any questions so far? Please. Very good question. What happens with the errors in promises, right? Um, where does that reject go? Now, there's a special, another special function in promises, and it's called the catch function. And if you are a sloppy programmer like me, what you do is you log the error as well. So log the result. If there's an error, log it as well, log the case. But obviously, in real life, what happens is somebody gets woken up 3 a.m. in the morning, and that says, hey, there's an error in your code. This actually literally works this way. Like, we have automated machines calling people at night when there's an error in a, in a web page. If you ever see Google breaking, you can make sure that like about 100 people already woke up at night um, and are working on that issue. Um, there are automated systems that we as companies pay that call people with a robot and literally read out the error so that when you pick up the phone at night, you can automatically already hear what the error is about. Um, this is what our, what our society has made. Uh, given too much freedom, we're building machines to wake people up with errors. Um, but yeah, this is how you normally catch errors, and you forward forward it to these automatic services that do whatever you want to do with the errors. Um, you use the catch function, and um, this receives an error. This doesn't receive a content. This receives an error. You can use catch on any promise, and at any given time. So this also works this catches only the first error and then neglects the errors of these this catches 
every error, if you put it at the end, it catches every error, and then you don't know where it's coming from. So that's very, very difficult. The question is, how do you distinguish between different errors coming through these promises, right? Um, normally, you can't. And that's why this is also a bad practice. You have to have specific catch um, calls for each promise so that you actually know where it's coming from. If you do something like this, a catch all function, you have to build into your error specific messages or breadcrumbs to find your way back and to understand where it's coming from. Obviously, it's going to give you the stack trace, the execution of the functions that ended up in that error. But it's in production systems, it's never enough. So obviously, everybody implements the catch-all function at all times. Um, and this is why when there's an error with a web page, we just see server error 500 and nothing else, no detailed um, explanation about the actual problem, because most of the people don't care, and they don't know, and they don't have specific error handlers. They, they just have these catch-alls. And whenever there's a, any error, it ends up in the catch-all. And then people being woken up at night have to find a way to trace back to the root of the problem um, because they have to solve it. And this is why it's really important to build resilient systems with graceful exit and fallbacks and catching exceptions and errors at all times. Does it make sense? Cool. How do you feel so far? Good? Bored? I think you're bored. Not you. Yeah, you. No. <laughs> it's fine if you're bored. Obviously, uh, we're just trying to do our best, but um, yeah. it might not be interesting and you may even want to yawn and sleep, that's fine. It's like the late evening as well. Um, I know it's very taxing for you as well because you're probably here after work or, or a heavy day and you're, you're trying to wrap your head around these very vague subjects like what are you, what, what am I even talking about? Um, but I'm very happy that you're all staying on. And now I'm going to get to the last topic of today's lecture and that is async and await. These are two new keywords that have been introduced into the language, um, into JavaScript, and they are actually taken from C Sharp. Um, when the first proposals were made, I think back in 2014 or 13, um, we were very um, aggressive against this. Like, no, we're, what are you even suggesting? We're never going to take a feature from C Sharp, which is a horrible <laughs> language to, sorry, no offense. It's a horrible language to program. <laughs> And then it turns out that, um, in fact, this is a great feature and really nice to have in your language. Um, async and await keywords are how C Sharp dealt with this problem of asynchronous programming um, by introducing new keywords to the language. Now, we, need, we didn't need it at all. I actually programmed with this approach for like 20 years. And I was super fine with this. I, I, I served my duty um, on, on this, figuring out the, the problem with the callback help. So I was like, I don't even need promises. For a very long time, I didn't use promises at all um, in my professional life. Um, and I still don't use promises. I only use promises only for async await, which is actually very, very nice to read and write. So promises were actually a what do you call it, a pavement um, block, a step towards async and await. The goal was to basically have async and await in the language. Okay. Stepping stone, perfect, thank you, thank you, yes. I've always seen promises as stepping stones to async and await, and now that we have async and await, nobody needs to write promises anymore. Um, of course, that first person still has to write this, but once you write it, nobody has to write these then and stuff. This is also a little bit weird 
especially when you nest these. And yes, you can nest these. Like here, there's a read file. You can do a den here, right? Do another um, function here and log the contents here. This is also confusing. What is coming after what? When is this going to execute? This is really confusing still. So we went on uh, importing async and await from C Sharp. And currently, this is the, the way we do asynchronous operations in JavaScript. And if you compare it to to the original one, it's pretty much the same. Like, if you do a line by line comparison, it's pretty much the same as synchronous programming, right? You just write await before functions that are asynchronous, which means they are also either awaiting something else or they have promises in them. So read file is something that returns a promise. If you face with promises in JavaScript, you can always await them right now. That's, um, that's the, the latest syntax. And now, obviously, nobody was denying that this is the easiest thing to write on the, on the, on the right. That's the, the easiest thing. You know, it's easy to read, easy to write, and it would be best if this worked, but it doesn't because it's synchronous, and we cannot afford to be synchronous. So we're also OK with this. This is the closest that it can get. That, um, is still asynchronous. So all the operations here are happening somewhere else um, in the background. Okay. However, um, I am waiting for them to complete before I move on. So this is very weird. Now let me run this. Let me comment out the, the previous examples. Okay. So I'm gonna Obviously, if I comment out the read file function, it's going to fail. So let me comment this in. OK. So I have this main function, which you would uh, be familiar with maybe if you dealt with C or something. There's always a main function that starts your program. Um, now, when I run this, OK, let's run this was the definition of read file when i run this you're going to see that this is executing in order okay the reason is i'm waiting for them however these things are asynchronous this is very weird i'm waiting for an asynchronous operation what does that even mean because i was i just told you that the whole idea is not to wait right um, that, and that I, I continue the execution, right? Um, yeah. Yes, but why? Why did I write it? Why? Why did I go back to the previous mode that I wait for these operations to finish? And what is asynchronous in this context? If I'm waiting for this. Am I not synchronous now? Please. Um, the, if the first content one is not done, it's still awaiting and goes to content two and also to three and deliver the result one to three. Do I understand right? Or? Yeah, <coughs> okay. Um, everything here, everything you see in this main function executes in order, okay? And I guarantee that by writing away, I make sure that I don't move forward until I get the contents of this first file. However, and you're going to see that, as you saw, this executes in order. No line executed before the other. However, um, this main function is, please. Um, could you just 
twice on the room. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. 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 So when I run it and go to the debug console, you're going to see the output here. Um, I first executed the main function and I saw console log one. Then I saw console log two, which was outside. And then I saw the contents of the files. Now, if I go in and type console log three here, basically I'm going to see first this, then while I'm waiting for this, I'm going on and doing the second one. And then I read this and print three. And then um, I read the swipe the second file, and then I read the third file. Now, the idea is if you have an async block, like this main function, everything inside behaves like synchronous. They're not synchronous, they just behave like synchronous. And that your main block itself is asynchronous. Okay? So that's why we have this behavior. So you can think that this whole main function is synchronous. For all it takes, its operation looks and behaves synchronously inside the function. However, outside the function, everything is still asynchronous. So I can do a lot more. Like I can have, I can call another main function here, do another console log here, and call another main function, right? Now, all these three main functions will execute in parallel. <coughs> or not in parallel, but asynchronously. There is no guarantee to the order of the actual contents to be written. Let's run this and see the output. Okay, I printed one inside the main function, okay? Then I printed two outside the main function because again, main got executed, got to the line um, 67, and it started waiting for the file. And then what this means is it can go on doing other stuff. The program can go on and do other stuff. What other stuff is there to do? Printing two, okay? Does it make sense? And then I call the main function again, another main function. I invoke it again. So obviously synchronously, it also wrote one. Then another asynchronous operation began, reading the, the first file, right? And that's why I see one here. And then I see what? What? Because that is the next synchronous operation. And then I call main again, okay? Which starts yet another asynchronous operation of reading the file, reading the first file. And obviously it also printed one. Um, that's why after what you see one again, because I invoked main again. And then after all these synchronous operations were finished, I get to the results of the asynchronous ones which is the content of the first iteration or the first file and the contents of the first file from the second main run and the contents of the first file from the third main run. Okay. And then the contents of the second files and then the contents of the third files. Now, let me remove these console logs so it's a little bit more clear to you. And let me run this again. So the idea is I have three main files, okay? Um, sorry, I, I have three main invocations. I invoke this function three times. And what it does is it gives me the contents of the files. 
Now, when you run this, you see the contents of the first file. Erste, 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 zweite, 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 and dritte, dritte, dritte. Why is this the case? Why didn't I see erste, zweite, dritte, erste, zweite, dritte, erste, zweite, dritte? Doing the first name of the derivative erste, the second also the derivative erste, and the third also. Yeah. And same thing happened when the first was getting, then second, then zweite was delivered. Yes. And same. And same with. Yeah, all the three cases. Exactly. So when I ran the main function the first time, it said to the operating system, give me the contents of the first file, and I'm going to wait. I'm not going to do anything else. I'm just handing it back to the main program execution. The main program execution then said, oh, I have to call it again. It started another process. Um, this is not the right word. It started another. Um, event loop, if you will, that you can read about this. Um, another series of operations in the event loop, actually, to be technically correct, but doesn't matter. It invoked main again, and the second invocation also said, okay, I need to read the files, the, the first file, the content of the first file, um, and then I'm going to wait until you give back, uh, give that back to me. And the program said, OK, fine. If you're going to wait, I'm going to go on. And I'm going to invoke it again. And then um, it turns out that the third operation is also reading the content of the first file. OK? And obviously, since this, these are the first things that I do, it's guaranteed that I'm going to get these three arste, arste, arste uh, in the beginning. Because currently, no other um, lines executed, right? Let's run this and see. Now I'm invoking main, okay? And please. No. No. Um, if if only you care about reading files, the, the contents don't matter because you already know um, that you want them in order. But obviously, if there's a specific order like the first one, the second one, and the third one, um, obviously you kind of have to know um, what order you want them at least. Does that make sense? Um, so let's run the execution. The first line is the main line. The first execution is this that I'm going to run in this example. Then I go to the, the first line, and I'm telling the operating system to fetch the contents of that file. OK? I gave that command away. The next line, um, oh, sorry about that. I have to put breakpoints here. Otherwise, it's not going to work. OK, so the first line is the main. The second line is reading the contents of the file. Then immediately after that, the second invocation of main occurs, because the operating system is busy reading the contents of the first file. OK? <coughs> then I run this. Since it's synchronous, the second call also wants to read the same file. Then I run it again. It's back with the main program. And that is re that also wants to invocate the main function. It's going back. And it's going to read the contents of the first file again. Okay? And there's no other operations on the main channel, let's say, to do. And if all of these take like 10 seconds, nothing will happen. We're just, we're all going to wait. After 10 seconds, whichever file arrives first will uh, pick up the execution and continue from just like this, logging its contents. And then, the next round will begin where the first function will say, OK, now read the second file. It's asynchronous again. So we just wait for the second files now. OK? This is why they're all appearing in this arste, 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 zweite, 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 and dritte, dritte, dritte order. Um, 
it's an example, it could be anything. It's like, think about a very long request that you made somewhere. So what does define what is long and short? For you, what is long and short? Five seconds is short for sometime, someone. Sometimes it's very long, especially if you're under pain. Um, it depends. The whole idea is that they are asynchronous, they are happening in the future, and we don't know when they're going to end. That's the thing. So it could be 10 seconds, 15 seconds, 100 milliseconds. In fact, reading files are very fast because they're uh, very um, small, and it takes maybe like 10 milliseconds. Easy. So in our example of our project with a person in India, can we read it? Can we actually create models yes. or modules? And I don't see how we would use asynchronous language in our models. So can we use it? Um, where do you use read file in your projects? Yes. Yes. So you use async and await whenever you want to do asynchronous operations. And currently in your projects, the only asynchronous operations are database operations. And that's where you, you're going to use them. So this is kind of the contents of this lecture. Maybe we can switch talking about the homework, because that's um, apparently what is in your mind, in everybody's mind. Um, the homework is, first, you're going to do these um, static create methods and map the objects that you read from the database to um, individual instances, right? Just like I did. I'm going to post the code that I wrote um, on Slack again. And the second homework is to replace your file read operations in your database with async and await. Okay? Um, sure. The first part is you're going to map your objects that you read from the files to actual instances by implementing the static method, static create, in your classes so that you map the objects correctly. Like if you have a meetup object that's an aggregate that has multiple persons inside, you also have to map the persons as well much like we did on the meetup. <coughs> here, much like we did here. You have to map the sub objects to their actual classes as well. And the second is to basically use the async await for your database operations. So you're currently using fs.readfilesync which is not a very good operation. You need to replace it with async and await. And obviously, you need a function like read file. You can directly copy my version that I created here. You can copy this and then use async await. Obviously, you need to come up with a write file version of this. This is only reading it. You also need a version for writing the file because you also want to write to the database, right? Um, and Basically, I want to see await and async in your code. Now, one, um, there's one catch here. If you want to type await here, this is not going to work. You cannot type await to the root of the file. Because, um, and this is going to change in the future. However, um, right now you cannot type it because Node.js doesn't want to be um, blocking at all. If you write await to, um, to the core file that you have, um, it's going to say await is only valid in an async function. Okay, That I cannot execute this in an asynchronous way. That's why I had to introduce a main function. This is also what you're going to use. I had to introduce an, um, an asynchronous main function. And in that, you can use await. OK? This is a gotcha that you will have to face. Do you have some, some uh, observations? Of course, you suggested to do the debug uh, workshop. But uh, as we are doing your uh, homework, so sometimes, like, maybe you took your M and uh, you got some. Uh, right on Slack. 
<laughs> Two days ago, I had a conversation with with a member at like 5.30 in the morning. They were up for some reason. I was up for some reason. We were both on Slack. They had a question and I answered. So it just works, right? On Slack. Um, the worst thing could be that I would be sleeping at the tower. And then whenever I'm awake, I'm going to respond. Um, the thing is, you have to keep your frustration level low. So whenever you hit a problem, if you cannot solve it in a fair amount of time, just write on Slack, and we're going to respond, and you're going to pick up um, one day later. doesn't matter. Please. Yes. Yes. I promise that it's recording right now. Um, thank you for coming today. And if you have any questions, just come to me after we're done.